All right, what the fuck is up? Welcome, bike, as they say. My name is Noah. You can find me on Twitter at No More Parties. And in today's video, I'm going to be diving into the profiles of some of the best non FBS, like small school running backs in this class, in this rookie class, trying to uncover the next James Robinson. I think I may have done it. And it probably isn't the guy you think. So, yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> The first guy I want to talk about is probably the guy you think I'm going to talk about, which is Pierre Strong. Um, he went to South Dakota State, and he had a decent production profile. He redshirted as a true freshman. His sophomore season, he posted an 18% dominator rating in the 46th percentile. Junior season, 25% dominator rating in the 56th percentile. As a, I guess not a senior, but as a redshirt junior, he posted a 19% dominator rating in the 31st percentile. And then this last season, his fifth year, redshirt senior, 28% dominator rating in the 61st percentile. And that's among like all running backs who eventually get drafted since like 2007. That's not just among like FCS guys. That's like everybody. So he went to a non-FBS school, South Dakota State, and the best dominator rating he posted was in the 61st percentile. So, ooh, and it was also in his last season, his fifth year at school. Based on the way I do things, I kind of adjust market share numbers for the level of competition and like the level of program a guy is playing at. So a little bit different than like traditional breakout metrics, but based on the way I do things, he broke out in that sixth year. I adjust market share numbers for like level of competition and the level of program a guy is playing at. So like a 20% dominator rating at Alabama probably counts as a breakout, whereas a 20% dominator rating at Indiana a state might not be a breakout depending on how good the team is, you know, level of competition, things like that. There's a higher threshold for breaking out at smaller schools, smaller conferences. That said, Pierre Strong never posted a high enough dominator rating given the level of competition, given the level of program he played at. He never posted a high enough dominator rating to justify a breakout in my process. So usually what I do with guys like that is just assign them a breakout age of whatever the next season was. So basically like when he declares to the NFL. So he broke out in year six, even though he didn't really break out. That gives him a breakout age of 23.6. Seven. Um, those are in the 10th percentile and the 5th percentile, so not great. It's probably worth mentioning that South Dakota State is like a pretty high-level FCS program. Their offense especially is really good. This last year they had like 7,000 yards and 69 touchdowns. So when you're playing at a program like Alabama or like Oklahoma and they're just like putting up these huge numbers, not a lot of guys are going to have high dominator ratings because it's just difficult to do that in such like a prolific offense. And so, you know, we kind of discount like the poor dominator ratings of like Damian Harris or Josh Jacobs or, you know, Jerry Judy or Jalen Waddle. Like these guys, it's like, okay, well, they didn't have a high dominator rating, but they played in like a supercharged offense at Alabama. South Dakota State, their offense was in like the same situation, but they're not it's not like he's sharing the field with Jalen Waddle, Henry Ruggs, and Najee Harris. Like, these are a bunch of dudes who weren't good enough to play at the FBS level, but they have a really strong FCS offense. So that's a little bit difficult for me to, like, wrap my mind around, like, what to do given their offense was so, like, exceptionally good, but the level of competition is so low. I don't know. I don't have an answer. Just something to think about. As a ball carrier, he didn't see, like, super high volume. He averaged 158 carries per 12 games, which is in the 52nd percentile. He averaged 1.07 yards per carry more than his teammates. His 10-yard run rate was 3% higher than theirs. That's in the 72nd percentile. Both of those actually are. And he was a pretty decent tackle breaker, 0.26 missed tackles forced per attempt, which is in the 78th percentile. Again, level of competition. His teammates probably weren't that great, especially relative to, like, the teammates of most of the other running backs who, like, posted similar numbers. So it's something you got to keep into account. But... He was a quality runner at the level he played. As a receiver, sort of the same situation as far as, like, involvement goes. 15.5 receptions per 12 games is in the 53rd percentile, but his target share was high, 12.7%, and adjusted for the size of his role, he was involved as a receiver quite a bit. His satellite score is in the 82nd percentile. He wasn't super efficient, and he wasn't used very dynamically as a receiver. He was split out wide 6% of the time, which is a 37th percentile number, A dot just 0.4 yards, that's 54th percentile, and his catch rate was pretty low, 69.6%, that's in the 23rd percentile. I've done a little bit of, of looking into, like, true catch rates for these guys lately, where I removed targets that were uncatchable, so just, like, what percentage of their catchable targets are there, are they collecting? And I don't have that data for Pierre Strong, so maybe the quarterback was inaccurate, and so that's why his catch rate is so low, but their offense was, like, ridiculously productive, so I can't imagine the quarterback was that bad. So, 
I don't know what you want to do with that. He didn't have a very high catch rate. Um, and his yards per target, yards per reception, yak per reception, all right around the 40th percentile. So low level of competition. He was involved as a receiver, not very efficient. And, you know, we got combine data for him. He came in at 5'11", 207, which is 31st percentile size. That's not very big. And given that he was 5'11", it's also pretty skinny. You know, he's not one of these like 5'8", 207 guys, like a Daryl Henderson or whatever. He's light and tall, which is not great. He was very fast though, 4'37", that's a 97th percentile 40 time. And his burst score is in the 71st percentile. So he's explosive, he's fast, while undersized. Kind of, I think the bottom line of Pierre Strong is it's tough to know like what to do with some of these numbers given that the level of competition was low but let's just like assume he's a good runner let's assume that those positive like yards per carry positive chunk rate positive missed tackles force numbers let's assume that those are legitimate and like are transferable to the nfl not necessarily he'll be out doing nfl guys like that but they're good enough that we should expect him to be good in the nfl let's make that assumption and he's a good athlete so good runner good athlete he's still undersized and skinny he has the kenneth walker problem that we thought Kenneth Walker would have, where, you know, if you're not a great receiver, which Pierre Strong apparently wasn't, you know, he wasn't very efficient, despite being involved in the offense as a pass catcher, not very efficient as a receiver, I don't know that that's a strong part of his game right now, and given his size, you kind of need to have that be a strong part of your game. He kind of has that, like, Ronald Jones, Chuba Hubbard, Tevin Coleman type problem, where he's a good runner, but given his frame, given his size, and the fact that he's not a great receiver, you know, he was involved there, but he wasn't efficient at all you know, at the non-FBS level, it's tough for those guys to find a role in the NFL. And like, again, going back to like his his production, just kind of like bird's eye view, how good was this guy in the context of his team's offense? He was ridiculously productive, just like the rest of the offense was, but there's a reason we use market share stats. And again, going back to that Alabama kind of question, I don't know that I'm willing to use that caveat for a guy who was playing not even at the FBS level. So decent, not great producer at the FCS level, good runner, athletic, not and if not like workhorse size at all and doesn't catch passes, tough to envision him being anything more than like a committee back. I think he's fine, but probably not great. The next guy I want to talk about is Quay Holmes. And I just kind of like stumbled across a mention of Quay Holmes on Twitter the other day and decided to look into him. He went to East Tennessee State, which is also an FCS program. He also redshirted as a true freshman, but then he was much more productive than Pierre Strong was. As a sophomore, 37% dominator rating in the 91st percentile. Junior year, 30% dominator rating that's 71st percentile and then his fourth season I guess his redshirt junior season 47% dominator rating that's in the 95th percentile and then this last year fifth year senior 37% dominator rating in the 84th percentile and he broke out year two at age 19.9 those are right around the 65th percentile so much more productive given his share of his team's offense than Pierre Strong was and as a runner he was pretty high volume he averaged just over 220 k carries per 12 games, which is in the 87th percentile. And as from an efficiency standpoint, he was basically the same as Pierre Strong. 1.11 yards per carry greater than his teammates, 74th percentile. And given just like the difficulty finding data, like I don't have 10 yard run rate numbers for him. I don't have breakaway run rate numbers for him. I don't have missed tackles force numbers for him. There's very little to go off of relatively with Quay Holmes. So all we know, pretty high volume. Out did the other guys at what the fuck was it, Eastern Tennessee State or whatever, by a little bit over a yard per carry. So do with that what you will. As a receiver, he was also pretty involved. 26 receptions per 12 games, which is in the 85th percentile. His target share was 12% in the 78th percentile. But given that he was, you know, kind of like just the offense there, he was relatively not involved as a receiver, given his overall role in the offense. So involved as a receiver, proportionally not so much. Um, His satellite score is in the 46th percentile. And the only efficiency numbers we have, like I don't have catch rate, the target share number there, I'm just using like a receptions to targets conversion based on like the average catch rate for running back. So I don't actually have target numbers, but based on his reception numbers, I'm I'm able to kind of like retrofit a target share number. But the only efficiency numbers we have is yards per reception. And he averaged 8.6, which is 33rd percentile. So he was involved as a receiver, not very efficient either. From a physical standpoint, he went to one of these little college all-star bowl games. I think it was the NFL PA Collegiate Bowl. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what it was. Um, and he was six foot one, two fifteen, which is decent. That's a little skinny as well, but that's you know solid size, fifty fourth percentile weight. And from an athleticism standpoint, he wasn't invited to the combine. I could not find if like what pro day he's participating at. I'm I'm not sure, but he looks slow. 
on tape to me. But we've seen guys at like non-FCS programs come through the pipeline, not be fast, and then be good in the NFL anyway. Like, you know, Tim Hightower, James Robinson, Rashad Jennings, Isaiah Crowell, Brian Westbrook, all these guys ran four, five, seven or slower and were fairly successful in the NFL. So it's not a death sentence by any means. Kind of the bottom line with him, high volume, efficient runner, decent size, really good production at the FCS level, involved as a receiver, not very efficient. And there's just like, given the lack of data, it's hard to know more about him. He was on the uh, FCS All-American team in 2021. Pierre Strong was the other first team running back. They were both the first team running backs on that team. So obviously like well-regarded given the level of competition. So he's an interesting guy to keep an eye on going forward. Okay, the next guy I want to talk about is Julius Chestnut out of Sacred Heart. I had also never heard of Julius Chestnut before. I was in this rookie mock draft with Nick and some dude at like the 110 had like the shittiest draft, took Julius Chestnut at like in like the third round. And I was like, who the fuck is this guy? So I looked into him and he's actually sick. Um, like kind of weird, but he's kind of sick. His true freshman season, he played, so he didn't redshirt. He had a 16.8% dominator rating in the 66th percentile. So he was pretty good as a freshman. As a sophomore, he posted a 46% dominator rating, which is in the 99th percentile. It's the third best sophomore season in my entire database going back to 2007. And among FCS players, it's the second best sophomore season in my entire database behind only CJ Anderson from back when he was playing at the non-FBS level. As a junior, he posted, I say this without exaggeration, the greatest market share season in the history of running backs in the last 15 years. His dominator rating as a junior was 60%. That's easily number one among juniors. It's the number one dominator rating of any player for any season in my entire database. It's ridiculous. And yes, he was playing at the non-FBS level, but like, so did David Johnson. So did Austin Eckler. So did Brian Westbrook. Like we've seen really, really good running backs come through the pipeline from these small schools. None of them posted as high a dominator rating as Julius Chestnut did as a junior. He came back as a senior posted a 31% dominator rating. He didn't actually play in most of their games this last year. That's a per game dominator rating, but I don't know if he was hurt for some of those or what. Either way, that's still a 71st percentile number. It's just not as high as what he did as a junior, but he broke out in that second year, 67th percentile. I don't know what his breakout age is. I just haven't been able to like track down a birthday for him. So he hasn't even tweeted about his birthday. So I don't don't know what his birthday is, but he broke out in year two. And I kind of want to go over the production comps for these guys. Just based on the way that I do comps, these small school guys, like non non FBS players generally comp to each other. So if I go sort these guys by their highest production comps, it's going to be like David Johnson, Austin Eckler, Chase Edmonds. Like if you have a strong production profile as a non FBS player, you're going to comp to the other strong non FBS production profiles. And so these guys all have the same four strongest comps, David Johnson, Chase Edmonds, James Robinson, and Austin Eckler. The difference between them is how strongly they comp to those guys. Pierre Strong, his number one comp from a production standpoint is David Johnson at 84.7%. And then Chase Edmonds at 84%, James Robinson at 84%, and Austin Eckler at just 80%. Those are not relatively strong. Quay Holmes' production profile comps very strongly to those guys. His number one comp is James Robinson at 96% similar, then David Johnson at 95%. Austin Eckler at 92%, Chase Edmonds at 90%, and then Julius Chestnut, his number one comp at Chase Edmonds, that's an 89% comp, also 89% for Austin Eckler, 86% for David Johnson, and 85% for James Robinson. So, Holmes comps very strongly to those guys, Chestnut is next, and what's interesting is that like he doesn't comp as strongly as Holmes, but that's because his numbers are just so much higher. It's difficult to comp strongly to guys when you have a 60% dominator rating. The same thing is true of Pierre Strong, but in the other direction. He comps strongly to those guys, but less than Quay Holmes does because his profile is relatively weaker than David Johnson's. So Holmes comps strongly because his profile is similar. Chestnut doesn't comp as strongly because his profile is stronger. Pierre Strong doesn't comp as strongly because his profile is weaker if that makes sense. As a rusher, Chestnut was really good. He averaged 227 carries per 12 games, which is in the 89th percentile. And then efficiency relative to his teammates is like off the charts. He averaged 2.2 yards per carry greater than the other guys on the team. That's a 95th percentile number. It's top 25 in my entire database. It's sixth among FCS runners and his 10 yard run rate, 7% higher than theirs, 92nd percentile. And he's a major tackle breaker, 0.31 missed tackles forced per attempt. That's in the 94th percentile. So overall efficiency, ridiculous relative to his teammates. Big play production, ridiculous relative to his teammates. And breaking tackles, 
even with the low level competition, like ridiculously good there as well. As a receiver, I think he's mostly a two down back, but his receiving profile is very, very strange. He only averaged 10.2 receptions per 12 games, which is in the 27th percentile, but his target share was pretty high 10%, which is in the 62nd percentile. But again, given like how ridiculously high his dominator rating was relative to his overall size in the offense, like he wasn't that involved as a receiver. It was mostly a product of him just being the best player on the team. And he was used kind of strangely. Um, he wasn't split out wide very often at all, 3%, 10th percentile, but his average depth of target was 8 yards down the field, which is in the 97th percentile among running backs. So he's lining up in the backfield and then catching passes deep downfield, like relatively deep downfield, which is strange. And his catch rate is only 62.5%, which is a 7th percentile catch rate. But given that his A dot was so high, like that kind of makes sense. It's not, it's not like a good thing, but it like makes sense that it was so low. And then given his high A dot, like his yards per target, 11.5, 95th percentile, yards per reception, 14.7, 95th percentile, like both ridiculously high, but yak per reception, very low, 5.5 yards after the catch per reception. That's a first percentile number for running backs, but that also kind of makes sense like relative to his A dot. It's a lot easier to get yards after the catch if you're catching a swing pass and no defenders are within four yards of you and the first guy you see is like a corner that you're running full speed at. If you're catching a pass like down the sideline or I don't know, up the seam, you know, kind of 10 yards down the field, it's a lot more difficult to catch that pass and then create, you know, yards after the catch, given that you're probably like, you're already in the secondary and there's probably somebody running with you, like covering you on that route. So very, very strange kind of like receiving profile, given that like he didn't catch the ball that often, but he was involved as far as like target share numbers go. He wasn't lined up outside, but he was catching passes downfield and he wasn't catching very many of them, but he was ridiculously efficient anyway. Nothing after the catch. It's just very weird and I don't really know what to think about it, but I think given that he didn't catch that many passes, is like he's probably mostly a two down back in the NFL with some like upside as a receiver possibly. So um, his size is really nice. 5'11", 226. And that was from, I think it was also from the NFL PA Collegiate Bowl. I know he got an invite to the Hula Bowl as well, but I think he ended up playing in the Collegiate Bowl. And his speed looks decent to me on film. It's a little tough to tell like how fast he looks, but where like Quay Holmes just looked definitely slow. Chestnut looks fast. And Sacred Heart doesn't have like their own pro day as far as I can tell, but I did watch an interview with Chestnut where he said that he would be attending the Yukon Pro Day, which I believe is on March 23rd. So we'll get to see him in a couple weeks you know, kind of run the 40, do the jumps and stuff like that. He said he's prepping for pretty much everything he would he would have done at the Combine. So um, we'll get to see his full athletic profile. But assuming he runs like a 4.55, Given his, like, size, given that speed, given his rushing efficiency numbers, if we kind of find comps for him, again, the comps for these, like, FCS-level guys are the other FCS-level guys just because, like, I take into account, like, level of competition and because it's so much lower than everything else. Like, if you're good, you're going to comp to David Johnson. If you're good, you're going to comp to Chase Edmonds and Austin Eckler and James Robinson. And so if we remove those guys and just look at, like, D1 comps, the closest pure runner comps for Julius Chestnut are Alfred Morris, Rashad Penny, and David Montgomery. Once we get, like, an official 40 time, it'll be easier to, like, filter through, like, which one of those guys makes the most sense. But, like, Rashad Penny ran, like, 4-4 or whatever. David Montgomery was, like, a 4-5-7 guy, 4-6-2 maybe. Alfred Morris ran, like, a 4-6-7. So, that's a wide range. But given how efficient Chestnut was relative to his teammates, you can run a slow 40 and still be comparable to some really good players. That same kind of comp for Pierre Strong, he comps strongly to among like FBS level guys, Eno Benjamin, Chuba Hubbard, and Tony Pollard. And I think that Chuba Hubbard comp is a pretty good one. They're similar body types, both really fast. Pierre Strong, I guess, is probably faster. I don't remember what Chuba Hubbard ran at. I don't remember what he ran, but Pierre Strong's fucking fast. So, but those, but like Chuba Hubbard also doesn't catch many passes. So Pierre Strong's like a straight line speed you know, slim guy, just like Chuba Hubbard is. I like that comp. And then for Quay Holmes, Michael Cox, Darius Anderson, and Jeff Wilson. So I used an assumed like four, six, five, forty 40 time for him just because he looks so slow to me on film. And so that's why a lot of those comps look bad, but his efficiency numbers were similar to Pierre Strong. So take that with a grain of salt. 
I'm like making assumptions about the athleticism of both Holmes and Chestnut in order to generate those comps, but just to kind of get an idea of like the kinds of players they might be like. I think the bottom line for Julius Chestnut is he's got like prototype size, ridiculously efficient. He has like a dynamic but weird receiving profile that I'm not really sure what to do with, but he's probably the most impressive like non-FBS producer of the last 15 years. Like he's more impressive than David Johnson, more impressive than James Robinson, more impressive than Austin Eckler, more impressive than Chase Edmonds. There's not really a guy that I can point to to say like that's the next closest guy. Like he just blows everybody out of the water. Like a 60% dominator rating is absolutely ridiculous. And even the other seasons, like 46% dominator rating as a sophomore, 31% dominator rating as a senior, like those are both also great. Like the sophomore number is ridiculous. It's not the junior number, but it's still nuts. Like even if that's what he had done, like he would have a ridiculous production profile. So one of the best producers of the last 15 years, like regardless of classification, he's just, he just looks really fucking legit. Like he's big. I think he's decently fast. Maybe he can catch the ball. I don't know. Awesome runner, breaks tackles, ridiculously productive. Like if there's the next James Robinson in this class, it's this dude, Julius Chestnut. Like he's better than Pierre Strong. I think that's pretty clear to me. I think he's better than Quay Holmes. I wouldn't be surprised if he's better than James Robinson. And a lot of what this comes down to is like depth charts shaking out and like making an impact on special teams and earning a roster spot and things like that. So it's very difficult to to predict like which of these guys will even make an NFL team or, you know, like end up getting touches in an NFL game. But as far as like pure talent goes, my evaluation is fairly straightforward with these guys and Julius Chestnut is the best one among them. And he's really looks like one of the best running backs in the class. Post combine rankings, he's going to be in my top 10 because he looks just fantastic. So next James Robinson is Julius Chestnut. Lock it in. Thanks for checking out the video. Hit like and subscribe. Have a good one. Peace.